national body that is sponsored by our chairman, let me sponsor the budgets of several agencies. And begin by saying, in today's knowledge-based and information-driven age, we face multiple challenges unthinkable in previous generations. Not only are we overwhelmed by the decreasing pace of technological innovation, we are also challenged in raising living standards of our people through quality jobs and access to our far-flung islands, both physically and digitally. We need to boost our competitiveness through education, technology, infrastructure, and smart governance. These issues, Mr. President, are already rocking the status quo in other countries abroad and overthrowing governments even. The Arab Spring is remaking the Arab world. The speedily gathering strength is the Occupy movement overtaking Wall Street as well as Main Street in many communities in the developed world, protesting against massive unemployment and unrestrained corporate gain. This radical change, Mr. President, is one compelling reason why government as usual is, will be harmful to our health and prosperity, and even more hurtful to our sense of national dignity. Mr. President, distinguished colleagues, I rise to sponsor the budget of the Department of Education, the Commission on Higher Education, the State Colleges and Universities, the Department of Science and Technology, the Cultural Institutions, the Department of Trade and Industry, and the Housing Agencies. Education, Science and Technology, Culture and the Arts, Trade and Industry, Shelter. Mr. President, these are the core elements that define who we are and what we can become. Let me briefly discuss each of them. Investing in education. Education, Mr. President, is a precondition to any form of development, whether social, economic, or whatever. This becomes even more apparent when we evaluate our present situation. In the latest Global Competitiveness Report, Mr. President, we only rank 110 out of 183 countries in terms of the quality of our primary education. Our ranking in math and science is even poorer, Mr. President, 115. If we allow this situation to persist, we can only expect the quality of our educational system to decline and even jeopardize our number 61 place in the world ranking. Yet the country's public expenditure on education amounts to only 2.6% of our gross domestic product and about 15% of total government budget. A figure, Mr. President, lower than any of our Southeast, South, Southeast Asian countries. Let, let me tackle elementary, primary, and and secondary education, Mr. President, first. During the DepEd budget hearings, Sec Secretary Luistro vowed to work fast to fill the short shortages in our physical needs, classrooms. The shortage in classroom today, Mr. President, is about 66,000 classrooms. And Secretary Luistro promised that by the end of this year, and we wish him well, that shortage will be reduced to about 34,000 and the whole shortage will be erased in 2012. The DepEd also plans to work on overcoming other physical shortages like desks, books, water and sanitation facilities. But that's how it should be, Mr. President, so that our teachers and educators can then concentrate on the more important issues of curriculum change effective teaching methods, retraining of teachers in math, science, and more important, 
well, most important in communication arts, in language, Mr. President, and the use of educational technologies. We hope that future budget discussions will focus on these issues rather than spending agonizing time, Mr. President, agonizing time year after year at the appalling school supply shortfalls, Mr. President. There are two other policy issues, Mr. President, that still beg uh, some answers. The first is the need for connectivity in our school system. Connectivity, Mr. President, the internet is a powerful medium for learning, and yet our connectivity penetration, Mr. President, is very, very shallow. So that ought to be number one, uh, well, not number one, but a priority for 2012, and we have allotted quite a substantial amount, almost two billion, Mr. President, for computerization. Second, Mr. President, is that we must scale up the feeding program, the school feeding program of the deaf ed as well as the DSWD, because there are two million children who go to school hungry, Mr. President, every day. Now let's move on to higher education, to the university level. Again, Mr. President, in this fast-changing world, we need to build our country's capacity to innovate through research and development. Our, our spending for R&D, Mr. President, is a minuscule 0 0.12, about 11% about of 1%, Mr. President, as against the UNESCO's prescription that we must spend at least 1% of our gross domestic product on R&D. The lowest, Mr. President, in Southeast Asia, well, one of the lowest, ahead only of Timor less than Cambodia. So we have a lot of catching up, Mr. President. In the 2012 budget, however, Mr. President, with the support of our chairman and the support of the DOST, the JET, the DA, as well as the <coughs> as well as the SUCs, Mr. President, we have put together, we incorporated a model of innovation, which we call innovation clusters. Let me explain what the innovation cluster will be. For the first time, we will have an innovation drive, Mr. President, producing practical technologies that are usable by government, by industry, but even by universities. Industry, this will be a consortium, Mr. President, of the government, of the university, as well as industry, a tripartite, tripartite joint venture, if you will, in research and development. What areas will they concentrate on, or will they focus on, Mr. President? We are suggesting <clears throat> areas like cloud computing. Cloud computing, Mr. President, is the next level to your laptop, storing all your files, etc. Cloud computing, we already have people in this country who can spread the, 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 the gospel. <clears throat> what else? Algae. Algae, Mr. President, is a potential source of feed, animal feed, as well as energy, Mr. President, for ethanol. Algae is perfect for us, Mr. President, where we have vast areas that are unutilized. So the, the university, on the other hand, will get a chance to demonstrate what they can do if they have funding, which they perennially complain about, Mr. President. And government, on the other hand, are just willing to contribute their funding to this uh, enterprise. So what are the areas of innovation clusters, Mr. President? First, as I said, an algae research cluster. <clears throat> Second, a cloud computing and software as a service cluster based in Cebu, where there is already a private industry uh, <coughs> set up that, that universities like San Carlos Cebu Institute of Technology and the UP can help 
can help uh, do research, Mr. President. What else? A smart agriculture and precision farming. Mr. President, in this age of climate change, in this age of shrinking land and shrinking water supply, we need to do precision farming. What is precision farming? Precision farming, Mr. President, in simple language, is using sat satellite data to pinpoint you, the productivity of your crops, the salinity of your soil, etc. Even the onset of of uh, of pests, Mr. President, can be detected through satellite uh, through satellite monitoring and imaging. The technology, Mr. President, is already available. We have an outstanding Filipino scientist in Washington, a NASA scientist who is already doing this and helping Mariano Marcos University in Batac, the hometown of our Senator Marcos, training the faculty of that university in, in precision farming, Mr. President, in using, in using satellite data to help farmers become more productive. What else? Well, we, we have, Mr. President, so many natural plants that can be source of medicines. We are not taking full advantage of that. Foreign pharmaceutical companies are the ones taking full advantage of that. And yet we have some of the best biotechnologies and biochemists in this country who can help us put together a natural <clears throat> medicine uh, program and a wellness program for Filipinos. The other, the other two, Mr. President, is uh, in responsible mining technologies. Mr. President, there are technologies now, especially in Australia, that do not use mercury or lead in, use in, in the mining industry, Mr. President. They are using water-based water -based, uh, water -based, uh, products in, mine, in mining that are environmentally friendly. And finally, disaster science and management, Mr. President. We are one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. In fact, we are number 10 in the world, Mr. President. And that is why we need to set up a research facility as well as train people to help us do better forecasting as well as prepare our people how to cope with disaster as well as how to mitigate when disaster strikes, Mr. President. These are, these are six areas, Mr. President, where Filipinos can excel, but except for the lack of focus and funding, we are unable to utilize the talents and the, the natural uh, supply of, uh, of, of products in, in these uh, areas. So, Mr. President, <clears throat> as I said, the DOST, CHED, Department of Agriculture, and the e-government fund have all fully cooperated to concretize these innovation clusters by providing government's contribution to the consortium. In the area of cultural institutions, Mr. President, we have provided some, <clears throat> some modest funding to the National Historical Commission for the first decade of the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day, to the and to, to the National Library, Mr. President, for digitization and preservation of priceless papers and documents that are just bundled up in the National Library. As, as well, Mr. President, we are providing some research money to the people, to the SUCs of the Cordillera, so that we, they can continue to do their preservation and conservation work on their heritage, on their cultural heritage, on their biodiversity, as well as adapt to climate change. Shelter, Mr. President. Housing, <clears throat> next to public works, Mr. President, or even 
parallel to public works are the most prolific creators of jobs, Mr. President. This, these are stimulative activities that create direct and indirect jobs in places where they are needed most, in rural and poor communities. According to the Housing and Urban Development Coordinating Council, every 100 jobs generated in the housing sector is accompanied by another 18 jobs created in the auxiliary industry supportive of housing. And the cost of creating one job in the housing industry, Mr. President, is so modest. It requires only 6,500 pesos to create one job in the housing industry. And yet the multiplier effect of house construction is such that for every peso invested in house housing construction, Mr. President, an equivalent two pesos is created for the economy. The magnitude of our housing backlog, Mr. President, is so staggering that we need some 361 billion until 2016 to be able to close this gap. I don't think government alone, Mr. President, can supply the money needed to close this gap. We need the active and vigorous support of the private sector. Trade and industry. Mr. President, for the first time we are seeing, and as we speak, our president just came back from the <coughs> APEC meeting in Honolulu. There in Honolulu, Mr. President, a Trans-Pacific Partnership is being covered together, being created, being sponsored, Mr. President, by no less than the United States. There are nine countries aspiring to join this, this Trans-Pacific Partnership, Mr. President. Australia, Brunei, Chile, Malaysia, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, and Vietnam, apart from the United States. Why, why is the Philippines not applying as a member, Mr. President? Well, I think if we want to expand our trade, Mr. President, and we want to create more jobs here internally, we better think about seriously joining this, Mr. President. I'm sure our economic ministers are studying this, uh, this prospect, but if we are late, Mr. President, we will be again late catching the bus. So we, we encourage the Department of uh, Trade and Industry to pursue this new grouping of the Pacific. Mr. President, like in the 16th and 17th century, when the Manila was the center of global trade through the Galleon trade, Manila, Acapulco, as Senator Jogar Arroyo knows very well, we were at the center of global trade and we started the globalization that we are now witnessing. The Filipinos were pioneers there, Mr. President. And now again we are seeing the return to the Pacific where even President Obama confessed to the Pacific being the center of recovery of the world because U.S., Europe, and Japan are down on their knees economically, Mr. President. But you, we, cannot, we cannot just simply ride through the tide, Mr. President. We've got to do our own homework and be an active, vigorous uh, uh, player rather than a bystander, Mr. President. I hope that uh, our uh, economic ministers, Secretary Abad and uh, Secretary Pateranga, are watching this development very uh, keenly because uh, we may be left behind, Mr. President, as we are already being left behind by our neighbors. And, and on the DTI, Mr. President, we have the we the budget is so biased towards helping the micro, small, and medium scale uh, uh, 
firms and enterprises in the present because the small and micro and medium enterprises, not the, not, not the San Miguel's or the PLDPs of this country, are the ones who are creating the jobs in this country and they are mostly in the countryside. So they really need support, total support of our government. In conclusion, Mr. President, the, there is, we are witnessing the economic turbulence engulfing European Union, Japan, and the United States. These economic downturns are highlighting how a world that has become prosperous, by and large, is now ironically becoming more inequitable stalking widespread unrest and discontent. We have seen that, Mr. President, through the Arab Spring and how it has remade the face of the Middle East. And we're seeing it again in the Occupy movement of, people, of young people who have absolutely no chance at landing a job and who are now complaining and complaining rightly that this is an unjust, inequitable a system that ought to be uh, corrected. Mr. President, let us not wait for that uh, Occupy movement to hit our shores. I remember in the 60s, Mr. President, when you were not even born perhaps, in the 60s, the, the water storm hit the UP when it was just started by a small minority in France, a student group in France, and it spread like wildfire, Mr. President. And I think this Occupy movement is such a phenomenon that people and business are asked to, to monitor and watch because this is, this is a protest of young people against an inequitable system and the corporate greed and the growing inequity between the the few who are very rich and the millions who are very poor, Mr. President. So the Philippines has a unique opportunity to escape this uh, economic turbulence uh, abroad if we do the right thing, Mr. President, and at the right time. I think the right time is the formula. We've got to do it at the right time, not yesterday or, or two weeks ago, today. And uh, unless we do that, Mr. President, I'm afraid we'll be swept away by the tsunami pace of change taking place now all over the world. This national budget, Mr. President, is our foremost weapon to do equity and justice and uh, create jobs and, uh, and raise the living standards of our people. If we spend right, if we spend on time, and it will push everyone to spend it honestly. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I move, as our chairman said, we move <coughs> to adopt the budget as proposed by the Committee on Finance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, finally, uh, for the sponsorship uh, speech, the other vice chairman uh, of the Committee on Finance be recognized, Mr. President, uh, Senator Ralph Rector.